Hello, hello, peace and blessings. Peace. My name, Laura Deverly. Um, honored to have you here. Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for tuning in. Welcome to our podcast, Unveiling Love Stories of Beauty and Social Change, where Oakland artists and leaders discuss their defining moments that hope shaping their effort to create safety, community, and solidarity. Some of you may know me as a visual artist, um, illustrator, a brand creation artist, um, muralist, but it is my core belief that as an artist, it is your, the way you live your life, the way you show up is your daily practice, your principles and values um, that lead your life, that inspire others to imagine what a better world could be. That to me is what uh, an artist means. And I have an incredible opportunity to work with Interfaith Movement for Human Integrity. So this podcast is part of our Love Over Fear Oakland campaign. And you will learn a little bit more about that in um in a moment but you know growing up in the east bay a lot of my childhood history was right in east oakland right in the heart of oakland chinatown the lake Merritt area and the history of oakland the fight for collective liberation that created global movements the art and culture helped shaped who i am today as a chinese muslim and I acknowledge that Oakland originally sit in the territory of the Huchin, part of the stolen land of the Ohlone people, right? Now, Oakland has been going through a lot of changes, a lot of changes. And with that, there's a lot of negative talk around that. However, I want to shift the focus on folks that are doing the work on the ground, defending love and creating safety for our community that has been historically the Oakland movement, right? And one example is Interfaith Movement for Human Integrity. They are doing this work. They are in the intersection of faith, spirituality, and social movements. And we have a great opportunity today to learn more about their work. Um, um, our first guest, Executive Director, Reverend Deborah Lee, who has been doing this work for over 25 years. She's a leader, educator, organizer, leading issues on race, gender, immigrant justice, mass incarceration, LGBTQ, been truly an inspiration for many, inspiration uh, for myself, definitely. They bring the faith voice to the social uh, movement. So. It's a great honor to introduce Reverend Deborah Lee. Welcome. Thank you, Amina, and hi, everyone. It's nice to be with you all. Yes, yes, yes. So this is our first podcast, and I want folks to know a little bit about our campaign, Love Over Fear Oakland campaign. Um, you know, I spoke a little bit about how Interfaith Movement for Human Integrity you know, has really bring a faith voice into the social movement. How did Love Here come about? And what are the goals here? Well, we started Love Over Fear because we wanted to really name the way that fear gets deployed in our politics, um, the way that fear gets used against to, to brew up hate against immigrants. Um, ca calling people invaders, you know, calling people um, as undeserving or unbelonging in our society and the way it, it's so easy for people to kind of fall into the ways that fear is used. Fear is also used against people of color. I mean, whether it's an election season or when any kind of progress or positive reforms start to get made, it seems like the backlash just turns to fear and, and stirring that up. Um, so against people of color, especially against black people, against people with former convictions, and that gets used to uh, justify like massive police budgets, massive militarization at the border, 
So for us, we're, we, we wanted to, to really encourage people to come at it from a different place, um, to be, especially people grounded in spiritual values, grounded in loving values, grounded in moral conscience, um, more grounded in a sense of humanity that, you know what, all this fear can be circulating out and it's, it's, you can feel it already, right, on the rise in this election year. Um, all this fear can be circulating around it, but we want to really go deep and ground ourselves in a conviction of love, in a conviction of care, in a conviction of neighbor, in a conviction of our, our shared humanity. And so um, how do we strengthen ourselves? So this campaign was about how do we strengthen ourselves and our values and how we act towards, you know, in their day to day values, but also in like, how do our values come through in our policies? How does it come through in terms of like the budget of Oakland? What does a, a budget based on care and compassion and root causes and loving our neighbors look like in the, in the city of Oakland? So, you know, we, we're kind of talking about this on a big national scale, in fact, an international scale, but we really wanted to pilot in Oakland, which there's a lot of fear that's getting circulated, a lot of negative rap in the media, and, and, we're, and we really want to lift up the goal of this project is to lift up people, stories, uh, ways that people are actually demonstrating love to their neighbors, you know, which doesn't get talked about in the news. Oh man, if you look at the nightly news, it's like, it's horrible, right? So we really wanna lift up these stories of, of ways that in our communities of Oakland, people are actually living out some different set of values, values that we need to, to be a, a stronger and united city. Absolutely. As well. and Reverend Deverly, you have been an example for myself and, you know, again, being born in the East Bay and raised in Oakland, I have such a, you know, connection with Oakland and Oakland Chinatown has raised me. The community has helped me grow into the person I am today. And I just want folks to get to know a little bit more about you and the wonderful work that you've been doing. Um, when did your relationship with Oakland begin? Well, um, you know, first of all, I wasn't born in California and I was actually born in the Midwest when I came, I came here as like a young person, younger adult, and really because of the diversity of the Bay Area and because of the openness of the Bay Area and because you could, you can kind of be who you are, you know, and you could be, you know, you can just be in your own skin. So the whole Bay Area, I think, has been a sanctuary and a place, you know, for queer people, for mixed race people, for people of color has been, you know, kind of like a promised land. And so that's kind of what drew me to this area. Um, and I, I first got introduced to Oakland, basically, you know, through this work, actually through work around immigrant rights. So it was like, you know, going to the Fruitvale, talking to immigrant communities, um, hearing what they hoped for in terms of Oakland being a sanctuary. And then really realizing that like, oh, you know, a, a huge part of Oakland is Latino and Black, right? And how do we have these conversations between communities? Because some of the common needs people have are the same, right? Jobs, ha affordable housing, um, you know, good education for their kids, uh, transportation, affordable transportation that's going to get them where they need to go to. And so we started having these dialogues, you know, between the Fruitvale, East Oakland, West Oakland, you know, and so that's actually kind of like my introduction into Oakland, you know, probably like 2009, 2010, when we were kind of pushing for our sanctuary ordinance in, in Oakland as the deportations under Obama, you know, were ramping up, you know, and people said, you know, we don't want just a sanctuary church because we want to be able to leave the church. You know, yeah. we don't want a sanctuary school because we don't just want to be in this church or in the school, but we want to have, you know, where, where we can be free and we can breathe everywhere everywhere we need to go where we're in a, in, a, in a way if we can have freedom of movement. Beautiful, beautiful. You know, I think for myself, um, being a child of immigrants, that really helped me um, define community safety. Um, what was like that for you? You know, I know that you were, you know, you're of Chinese descent, your parents were immigrants. Was there moments that, you know, you learned that, okay, this is what community safety means me with your family yeah I, I often joke like I feel like I'm a refugee from the state of Ohio I mean 
no <laughs> no shade on ohio but like for the bay area you know it the whole the whole california was like a safer place for me uh as i mentioned and i want to lift up you know chinatown because i think you know when i first came to the bay area you know my grandmother like chinatown was her, her sacred place and it was a place because she didn't speak english but she could go there and she could operate as a member of society and a member of the community and she could go to a, like a, a church there she could go to the grocery store like she could be who she was so to me uh, you know and i our office is right now in oakland chinatown you know chinatowns all over the world to me are sacred places because they are sanctuaries um, for for immigrant communities so when I, was, when I was working downtown Oakland, I would just go to Chinatown on my lunch break and I would go to go to take the free Tai Chi classes at the at the Lincoln Rec Center, you know, over my lunch break and like pick up something from the bakery or pick up some fruit or something, then go back to work, you know, but it was like a, a, a place where like the smells familiar, the sounds are familiar. Um, and that's and that's so important for a sense of belonging. I think I think belonging and safety are and and like being a full human being those things are really connected yes yes that's i you know even i was born here um but actually english wasn't my first language i, I spoke chinese and chinatown was my sacred safe place so that defined my safety um, but now as a chinese muslim and what we're going through currently in this country. I find myself thinking about my own safety when I have my headpiece on, when I decide to wear my hair covered. And one of the things that really stuck out to me with this campaign is the intersection of faith into social movement. How important is faith, this, this layer of spirituality in this world? In this yeah i think for me like the power of faith I mean is about staying power you know so like in these communities where you go to the fruit vale or you go to west oakland or you go to chinatown you know there are faith communities who have been there to serve that population in in the in the cultural ways that that resonate and um you know, they've been a place for reflection. They've been a place for rituals, right? Like where you celebrate the important things in your life, um, the births, the deaths, um, places where you make meaning, places where you find community. So uh, I wanna just shout out, you know, the anchor faith institutions around the communities who, who've been there like for, for over a hundred years that are serving some of those communities. They're not the only institutions, you know, who do that. We need new institutions. Who are building community but faith um in social movements to me is about like how do we keep nourishing how do we keep nourishing people to go on how do we keep people connected to the values of love uh connected to like oh yeah this is how i want to be a good person and i gotta remind myself right i gotta remind i gotta practice you gotta practice faith as a practice right we practice it so we keep orienting ourselves towards the world we're trying to create so I think faith in social movements is a key piece. Um, an interfaith movement for human integrity, people who know us and kind of organize with us, that's what we're trying to bring. Uh, we're trying to bring a, a sense of spirit, a sense of um, connecting to people's humanity, yeah. connecting to like acknowledging the suffering and lifting people up and, uh, and, and, and appealing to the decision makers to do the right thing because they're they're also human and they also have a set of values and they also a lot of times have a faith that they ascribe to and so it's like how are we in dialogue with them about how are they living that out in the the day-to-day -day decisions they're making in governing our city right right yeah I, you know and as i do this work my faith is at the front of you know my decision making and help me cultivate these relationships um you know I, whatever diverse background ethnicity it's my faith that i'm like hey let me let's connect let's commit connect on these core values you know no matter what and so i think you know like for example growing up you know i had trouble at home with family but it was the community it was the teachers friends of diverse background that helped me stay afloat it was community and so how can we build multiracial solidarity 
what are things that, that you believe that could really help cultivate that, you know, and also unite faith communities too. Yeah. Well, that's, that's really, really kind of the mission of interfaith movement for human integrity is to be a multi-faith, to be multi-racial. Mm -hmm. And how do we build beloved community, you know, bring, bring the, bringing those different elements together. Um, so, you know, our mission has been like, we want to unite against the criminalization of people of color in this, in this country. And we come together around our shared values of human dignity, um, the sacredness of every person, um, you know, peace building, nonviolence. And like just coming together and meeting each other is, is, you know, and like doing the work, like just, just what day was it? On Wednesday, right? You were here in Oakland Chinatown at the Buddhist church we had a vigil and we had a speaker come who had experienced Japanese incarceration during World War II, uh, Floricel, mother of, of three who's facing deportation from the Latinx community, facing deportation imminently, and somebody from Palestine, you know, in the West Bank, who's just seeing, you know, the, the destruction of the community around him. You know, so it's like we want we come together to hear these different stories from and we're coming from different places. But but it's like being in the same room together, deciding to take action together, being on a bus together, like like that's how we start building our multiracial solidarity. And I want to give one more example too, because uh, you know, Oakland Chinatown a couple years ago, I think during the pandemic, right? There was all that API hate stuff happening and you know like literally right below our in front of our building you know we're on the third floor but looking out the window you know we, we you know we saw some elders get pushed really violently and you know the impacts of street crime and I think there was like an impulse for people to kind of want to defend the API community but in a way that could criminalize and stigmatize other communities so for us, like, we're like, no, 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 we cannot do that. We want to do this in a way that really says, we got to understand the roots of this. We got to understand the roots of, of, of street crime. Uh, we got to understand the roots of hate between communities. And we have to get at that. We just can't call the police, put people in jail, put people in prisons. Like that, that's what this country has already done for decades. And it hasn't made us any safer. It hasn't. Right. Safer. We need to, and, and so I, I mean, I saw a change in our in our community outside our office, where, like five years, years ago, it was really derelict. Like, not only was there violence against people individually, you know, and it was feeling kind of sketchy, but like, the community felt neglected. Like, the sidewalks were broken, the buildings were all boarded up and tagged. You know, like after five p.m. Sometimes after three p.m. because the shopkeepers were afraid. You know, so it's like that that doesn't build a sense of community and, and, and that's not feel like a sacred place, right? And I kept thinking, where's the investment from the city that shows that these communities matter, that immigrant communities matter and they deserve lights and they deserve like roads and sidewalks that aren't broken. So I could see like in the last few years, I wanna shout out to our city council representative, currently the, you know, the, um, head of the president of the city council in Oakland, who represents our district, Nikki Bass. You know, I could see like money started coming in, in government investment to like fix the sidewalks so people weren't spraining their ankles, you know, the elders, you know, and like just to make this feel like this community mattered because this community pays taxes, right? But we weren't getting the revenues back from the city. So, you know, um, there was like street ambassadors to help walk people, walk elders. I mean, I would get walks from my, office to the BART station. There were people who, you know, ambassadors who would help walk me to the BART station if I didn't feel safe at the times of the year that it was already dark. And so other things that we can do, that the community can do. So this is what the investments that we need in the community. And we, we, we don't want to use, you know, the other forces will try to divide us up and scapegoat one community or the other, but we have to build uh, a way that builds our multiracial understanding. And that's what this project is about. And you are one of our cultural strategists. Uh, we got three cultural strategists through the Bay Area Creative Corps. 
you know, change makers who are going to help us have these conversations in the community. So I know you on the podcast are going to have different people speaking from different communities in Oakland. Um, B Dukes is going to be like interviewing people and doing a beautiful photo exhibit of folks uh, across Oakland that are doing um, acts of community care. They're, they're actually sites of sanctuary and community care. And Francisco Herrera will be doing some concerts, like retaking public space, yes. public space that people are afraid of, yes. afraid to do, afraid to hang out and retaking that with like concert and warmth and love. So, so these are all things that I think are really important. Like we've got to know this, we, we need to know the stories of the diversity city of Oakland, you know, starting with the first peoples of Oakland, you know, and Karina Gold, who's the tribal elder. We got to know the stories of the first peoples. We got to know the stories of the African Americans who came to Oakland seeking jobs, you know, seeking a place away from the racism of the South. Um, we got to know the stories of immigrants who've come from Asia and Latin America uh, and Africa uh, the Pacific Islands, all over the world, they all come to Oakland. You know, we, we have to know their and value their stories. Yes, yes. And, and it is, well, it is an honor to be a cultural strategist on this campaign. I am so excited. You know, I think one thing that really concerned me is, again, this is the culture that raised and inspired me. But when I heard all the, the negative talk and the politics that came, you know, with discussing issues, I was like, what can I do as an artist to break down this division, you know? Um, and it's more than just painting, you know? It's, it's, it's inspiring those to reimagine, um, you know, right now as a community, what can we do to, to create safety? So I know that, you know, art is really important aspect of this. Campaign. What are you looking for um, as far as, you know, what artists can contribute uniquely to this. Yeah, we're so excited to have artists. Oops. Hi, Michael. Uh-oh. My mom. <laughs> um, mm -hmm. So excited to have artists. Can you go over there? Um, we're so excited to have artists, you know, part of this campaign, because I think artists bring imagination, bring imagination imagination and they bring humanity like art is so human art really touches our hearts and you know like in like one picture you know you, you just go straight to the heart right one painting can go straight to the heart so i feel like you know having artists will help us imagine community safety in a different way um community safety isn't just about the police in fact they're making our communities more dangerous in many cases you know so we've got to like get out of that default so i think artists will help us um you know lift up lift up the ordinary ways that people are take we're taking control of our own community safety yeah. and caring for one another in our Absolutely. neighborhoods Absolutely. Yeah. 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 my best <laughs> out there um so, and talking about, you know, community, let's engage in this conversation. If you have any um, questions, comments, um, questions for Reverend Deborah Lee, please um, comment um, as I'm going to be, you know, um, sharing that in our last few minutes of this podcast. Um, the definition of unveiling, unveiling in this podcast, that word was really important to me, to unveil. Uh, the definition is the removal of a veil um, or covering or work art as a, as a part of a public ceremony. It's the presentation or announcement of something in public for the first time. I know that love is used in so many ways, but in this very moment with everything that you share with what's going on in Oakland, if we were to take the covering and unveil the face of love what would it look like and what must it have i think what we're unveiling is beauty you know that that oakland is beautiful and the pe people in oakland are beautiful uh people everywhere 
where are beautiful. And I think um, we're unveiling it because, it, it, I mean, it, we're unveiling, it's actually there all the time. You know, it's like love is there. It's like the air. It's, it's there for us. The beauty and the sacred is there for us if we, if we dare to notice it, if we dare to see it, if we take a moment to notice it and to see it and to lift it up. So that's what I think we're, we're unveiling, like what's, what's really underneath and what's, what's our shared humanity, um, what's our common desire for our families and for our communities. Like, like it's there. There's a lot of stuff that gets thrown on top that makes it like we're conflicted. But I think we're, we're trying to unveil like the, what connects us deeply beneath it all. Right. Right. And can you share with us like quickly um, while doing this work, fighting um, mass incarceration or standing for the rights of immigrants, right? Um, what was, was there any moments that you saw where these people were like, I feel safe right now. This is what I need to feel safe. And it pops up in your mind. Uh, you know, we, we do a lot of rallies. We call, we call them vigils because there's usually like music and prayer and testimony as part of it. But we do a lot of rallies, you know. So, you know, for a lot of immigrants, it's a very scary thing to participate in a political action, right? Like, is immigration going to use this against me? Is the police going to show up? Am, am I going to be unsafe? You know, those are real concerns. Um, so I think the opportunities where we've had vigils and like folks who don't have papers or who are you know who are afraid to like be in that kind of space and then they come and then they feel the love in that circle or in that community maybe even like what we experienced on wednesday this week right where people experience that um you know i i feel what i sense in that is they feel a sense of freedom like oh i can be here i can be safe in this collective mm. I can say my truth, right? And and now I have this community backing me up. And I, I've just seen that. I mean, I've seen that with like, I've been involved in some actions with undocumented people where they were risking arrest. Mm -hmm. You know, they could have gotten deported over that arrest for, you know, we were blocking uh, an immigration deportation bus. And um, I remember like walking, you know, we got sighted we came out of the police station and I remember talking to, to one of the undocumented youth and he said, I feel so free. Wow. Yeah. And he was like, like what, uh, like I'm living with all this fear of like what they can do to me, what they, where they might send me. And like this sense of freedom that came from the sense of action, like it, it, it like uh, that, that he could take like the riskiest action and he felt so free. And I, I, I just, that statement just sticks with me because that, that's not what I thought he was going to say, but that was powerful, right? The sense of, so I think there's so many ways where our society because of racism or sexism or gender, you know, gender exclusions and stuff like it tries to keep us small and tries to say, we can't be free. Like mm. we can't act. We can't be fully ourselves. We can't be fully human. Um, but that's the society we want. Like that's the potential. If everybody could be fully who they are and fully human. So we want to get rid of those systems that shrink people down, you know, that diminish people's power. And we want to live. That's what we mean by liberation, right? We want to live. So we don't want people to be afraid of the police. We don't want people to be afraid of ICE. Like we want people to feel they can fully be members of our community, um, full members of our society. So that's, I forgot what the question was, but I guess to me, that's love. I know your question was about unveiling love. And when people can feel that sense of love, like we can say love all the time, but when you can feel that power, you can feel it, it's a, it's a whole other thing. Yes. Uh, and, and, that, and that like, it, it's like, a, it's a little bit addictive, you know, like it's very contagious, it's addictive, and you, you want more of it, right? And I've seen that with like people like Floricel who spoke Wednesday, she, she's fighting for herself right now and for her family, but I've seen her fight for so many other people and families and people going beyond themselves. 
So when you when you receive love, you want to extend it. You want right. to and and the key word that you said that really stuck out to me was feel that they feel at home. And I think that is a really in defining safety. So, you know, even though we're kind of I, I would say we're kind of going through birthing pains that all these changes are happening in Oakland. But what I experienced, what I felt, you know, um, a few days ago at our the, the visual, um, I saw the voice of Palestinians. I saw the issues of, you know, deportation. I saw, you know, the Japanese survivors sharing their stories and just coming together. They're like, I can be myself here. I can, this feels like home. So I think we are also redefining what home means. Um, and as a Muslim, you know, these values of freedom, justice, equality is very important to me. Freedom to be myself is, um, creates peace, creates peace and safety. Yes, I am so, so grateful and thankful for this podcast and the honor to interview you and i'm so excited stay tuned everyone for amazing leaders and community members that are you know true artists to me because they're leading their life they're showing up in their daily practices to inspire others so we can build this collective liberation for all please if you have any last questions for reverend deborah lee this is the time to do it um Reverend Deborah Lee, is there any upcoming events and things that we can look um, from? Um, I'm trying to think here. Let's see. Well, I know there's going to be, I mean, I hope people could follow us, of course, and um, there's going to be actions. We are, you know, really supporting Floricel, this mother, to stop her from being deported. She's not the only one. There's several mothers. So Mother's Day is coming up soon. And we're going to be building and adding on to this campaign. Oh, I have another one. Uh, March 23rd, we are or co-organizing with others a ceasefire pilgrimage. So mm -hmm. it will be a 22-mile walk. That 22 miles is how long Gaza is. Mm -hmm. So Gaza is a tiny place that has just received like an you know, unimaginable amount of bombardment over the last four months. So we'll, it'll be a walk. People don't have to walk the whole time. They could you know, take a chunk, um, but um, it will be an interfaith pilgrimage, interfaith, no faith, like just come, but we're gonna pray with our feet, um, meditate with our hearts, um, lift up, conscientize our communities, why we're taking this this walk. So that's Saturday, March 23rd. So, um, you know, get, get on, sign up on our, our email list, you know, on our website or follow us here on, on, on Instagram. We'll, we'll be sharing it there too. So those are some two, two big things that I hope people put on their calendars. Yes. Yes. And we do have a question in the chat. Um, the question is, you said it's March 23rd. They're wondering about the location. They would love yeah. to participate. It will be in the Bay area. We're probably going to start probably like in Berkeley and head South. Because, like, you know, the bay goes long ways, too. But the bay is kind of, like, shaped like Gaza. So we're going to be walking down south through that. So, yeah, we are looking, you know, every day there's actions on Gaza. And we're, we're trying to participate in different things. But this is a, a thing we're planning out a little bit more in the future. Powerful. Now, see, that's art. We're praying with our feet. Every, like, we're gathering and we're walking. Um, that is a form of prayer. And I don't know. Well, another, the highest form of art is prayer. Beautiful. Thank you so much for your time and for this conversation, Reverend Deborah Lee. Guys, please follow um, our social media for more information. Definitely sign up um, for the emails. All right. Have a wonderful, blessed day and stay tuned. Stay tuned for more conversations um, and be safe and lead with your heart with love. Salam alaikum. Bye, everyone. Peace, everyone.